In the mid-17th century, Blaise Pascal invented a calculator to help his father with tax accounting. Ancient cultures have looked at the stars for thousands of years, wondering about their place in the universe. Slowly, knowledge and understanding accumulated until the conditions were ideal enough for a revolution in thinking, experimentation, worldview, and natural philosophy. During the scientific revolution, Western theologians had more and better tools to measure and make sense of things around them. Francis Bacon, the English philosopher, set the stage for arguing for the importance of empirical data and inductive reasoning. With careful measurements, precise data collection, and an unwavering sense of curiosity, humankind stepped into the future. Besides scientific discoveries, the genuinely magnificent feature of this time was the kinship between philosophers, scientists, and experimental hobbyists throughout Europe. Hundreds, if not thousands, of letters between great intellectuals such as Isaac Newton, Johann Kepler, Robert Hooke, and Tycho Brahe have been preserved, demonstrating how these men and a few women worked in cooperation with one another to better their research. From heliocentrism to Cartesian skepticism, from groundbreaking discoveries in astronomy to the invaluable progress in chemistry, the scientific revolution was an era of innovation for the Europeans. Here are seven great inventions of the scientific revolution. Cartesian skepticism. René Descartes, a French philosopher, believed we should attempt to keep our assumptions to ourselves. Descartes argued that no scientific report or experiment should be given merit based on the scientist's proof of his point. Instead, hypotheses should be proven through a chain of reasoning and exposed to elements that may altogether disprove them. Descartes was so skeptical of the supposed realities of science that he was reluctant to commit himself to any particular belief or conclusion. He famously wrote, Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, which means that because Descartes was able to think, he knew he existed, but he was hesitant to assume anything else. Descartes wanted his work to be read by all his fellow Frenchmen, so he forewent the typical Latin treatise on his subject and published it in French. The Discourse on the Method of Rightly Conducting One's Reason and of Seeking Truth in the Sciences outlined the benefits of deductive reasoning. This methodology was closely linked to the author's education in law. Descartes posited that conclusions about any idea or object could only be drawn once all doubt had been removed. If an experiment had unexpected results one time out of ten trials, solid conclusions could not be drawn. Experiments should be repeatable. Otherwise, they must be disregarded. Though Descartes is generally remembered for his contribution to scientific methodology, he was also a brilliant mathematician. He found satisfaction in mathematical studies from an early age because of the controlled methods and sound complete answers involved. Working specifically with geometry and algebra, Descartes created the new field of analytical geometry to link them together. He created the Cartesian coordinate system which uses X and Y to represent dimensions in a regular graph. The Modern Thermometer Galileo was among the first men to use elaborate thermoscopes, devices showing temperature changes. However, it was not until the early 18th century that the thermometer as we know it came into existence. Early versions or predecessors of the thermometer had existed since the days of classical Greece, which means, at the very least, people understood the basic principles of thermometers. They knew that substances could contract and expand when cooled or heated. In the 16th and 17th centuries, people began to make headway regarding accurate temperature measurements. Santorio Santorio, an Italian physician and physiologist, created the first thermometer with a scale and tube in 1625. Inventors like Ferdinando Medici made similar instruments, each with distinct advantages and disadvantages. Most of these devices were susceptible to air pressure and used different scales to quantify temperature. In the 1660s, the idea of a standardized scale was introduced. Christian Huygens, Joachim Dalens, and Isaac Newton proposed different graduations based on body temperature and water's freezing and melting points. Different scales still exist – Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. In the early 18th century, Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit, a physicist, solved the issue of measuring air pressure by replacing it. He introduced mercury to gauge temperature. The use of mercury was eventually adopted as the standard, and the physicist's scale became common too. It is known as Fahrenheit. 
Anders Celsius, another physicist and mathematician, introduced a scale with zero and hundred corresponding to water's freezing and melting points in 1742. By the end of the 18th century, thermometers were standard equipment for various purposes. The Mechanical Calculator For the longest time in history, arithmetic has been the obsession of many scientists, polymaths, and astronomers. In the 17th century, Blaise Pascal had the ingenious idea of simplifying this task by mechanical means. Pascal was somewhat of a child prodigy, excelling in daunting subjects like philosophy, mathematics, and theology. He often saw his father, Etienne, knee-deep in work with his helpers, sorting taxes manually or with an abacus. At 18, Pascal invented a mechanical device to help his father with his tax accounting. The machine was called Pascaline, or the arithmetique. From 1642, the initial invention, to 1665, Pascal worked on his prototype, improving it in specific ways. He possessed a pioneering and entrepreneurial spirit like none other and wanted to manufacture his devices on a large scale. This, however, was no more than a mere fantasy, as he sold maybe 10 to 15 machines. But he never ceased working. His obsession with the machine kept mounting until he received a patent or a privilege for the arithmetic machine. While the continued fixation helped Pascal attain fame and attention, his ambition eventually burnt out. The mechanical calculator worked very much like the rotary phones of yore. A person would use a rod to feed one number and then the next. The machine would calculate the sum and show it. The mechanism rotated in one direction, making simple subtraction complicated. However, the consumer could subtract using a nines complement. Pascal's fascinating invention became a cornerstone for future innovators, although it was not the most influential of its day. Physicists, scientists, and engineers tried their hand at similar machines, evolving them with every iteration. The modern computer can probably be traced back to the Frenchman's hobby. Modern Chemistry Robert Boyle was initially concerned with ethics and rhetoric. Still, after a decade of examining and philosophizing French literature, he became interested in natural philosophies. In the 1650s, he began spending much time with the Hartlieb Circle, a group of intellectuals centered on the educator Samuel Hartlieb. Among the members of the Hartlieb Circle were a few experimental scientists whose work enthralled Robert Boyle. Boyle's relationships with scientists who dedicated their time to conducting hands-on experiments inspired him to design and conduct his own. A great deal of data upon which the scientific revolution depended was compiled through experiments that looked at the world on a much smaller scale than ever before. Just as physicians needed to look inside their specimens to learn about the organs and tiny vessels that made up an animal, so did Robert Boyle change the scales in his pursuit of knowledge of chemistry. Through a series of experiments, Boyle realized that the volume of a gas decreases with increasing pressure and increases with decreasing pressure. For a specific mass of gas, Boyle discovered that the pressure multiplied by the volume of that gas equaled a constant, nearly unchanging number. This relationship is called Boyle's Law. Thanks to Boyle's seminal research on the invisible matter, he has been called the father of modern chemistry. Indeed, at a time when physical experimentation was focused on objects one could observe with a naked eye or lens, working with air was a tricky and unique venture. Boyle's were some of the first successful experiments to expose the inner workings of matter itself, which became the foundation of modern chemistry. A Revolution in Physics Everybody's heard the story, Newton watches an apple fall, he has an epiphany. Newton had an excellent reputation as a brilliant scientist. He befriended Robert Boyle and studied his work closely, including Boyle's writing on alchemy, for which Newton had a secret passion. At the Royal Society, Newton began discussing his ideas about the physical movements of the Earth and the objects upon it. In 1687, he published The Law of Gravitation and the Three Laws of Motion in his masterwork, Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica, known in English as Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. One, every object persists in its state of rest or in uniform motion until it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed upon it. Two, force is equal to the change in momentum per change in time. For a constant mass, force equals mass times acceleration, F equals ma. Three, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Telescope. 
For years, man has been looking to the stars for answers. While ancient mythology and folklore presented it as a symbolic idea, some gentlemen preferred the literal tale. So, they set to write their own. While the optical ideas that led to the invention of a telescope can be traced to Islamic scientists, it was not until 1608 that a commendable device was formed. Three Dutchmen, Hans Lippershey, Zacharias Jansen, and Jacob Matthias, were responsible for the device. Many people believe that Galileo invented the telescope. It was not his invention, but a constant work of scientific innovation. Whereas Lippershey's original telescope consisted of two lenses and presented an upside-down image to the observer, Galileo experimented with different lenses to further magnify objects in view and switched the final image right side up. Using his telescope, Galileo looked up at the moon, which he could only view about one quarter at a time. He was excited to discover that the surface of the moon was not smooth, as had been assumed, but that it was covered in pockmarks, hills, and valleys. Once Galileo Galilei fine-tuned Lippershey's invention for detailed stargazing, Johann Kepler extended his lens work to include telescopic observations. Kepler was intrigued by the physicality of the telescope and how it could be best put together. His book, Diopteris, published in 1611, explained how a telescope worked and described the differences in the types of images it produced. The Compound Microscope there is a famous anecdote about Thales, the pre-Socratic thinker, who was so lost in thought, looking at the sky, that he fell into a well. Like most ancient tales, it is likely exaggerated, making fun of Thales' predilection for grandiose cosmologies. Yet, it serves as an excellent analogy for the invention of the compound microscope. While Galileo and his contemporaries were looking at the skies, a young kid and his father, the Hans and Zacharias Jensen duo, were looking below. They discovered that fitting the ends of a tube with a lens allowed them to enlarge the image beneath. A simple microscope had a single lens, while a compound microscope has multiple lenses, allowing for greater precision and detail. The first compound microscope could only zoom in three to nine times. However, within a few decades, the magnification of microscopes had increased dramatically. Robert Hooke, the English scientist remembered for his great discoveries in biology, could only draw microorganisms due to the new gadget. From the humble inventions to mind-boggling philosophies, the scientific revolution was the perfect transitional phase from the Middle Ages into the Enlightenment. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about the scientific revolution, check out our book, The Scientific Revolution, a captivating guide to the emergence of modern science during the early modern period, including stories of thinkers such as Isaac Newton and Rene Descartes. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.